All right, welcome everyone. My name is Lisa Sipengo. I head Concilium Scientific. Today we're starting a new series of events um, together with Cancer Research UK. And we're very pleased to welcome a distinguished panel, which will be discussing understanding the economics and regulatory challenges of cancer prevention to unlock future opportunities. And today's panel is being chaired by David Crosby from Cancer Research UK, and he's the head of uh, prevention and early detection research. So David, on this note, I'm passing the chairing to you, please. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here today and uh, bearing witness to what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you very much to our four panelists uh, for being with us today also. Um, and perhaps we'll do a, a quick round of introductions. As, as uh, Lisa said, uh, I'm the Head of Prevention and Early Detection Research at Cancer Research UK, um, which is a, a large charity uh, funding cancer research. Um, perhaps uh, Nick, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nick Woolley. I'm a manager at Frontier Economics. We are a consulting firm applying microeconomics to public policy, regulatory, commercial uh, questions. Uh, I myself specialise in health and social care. I'm really pleased to join the discussion today. Thank you, Nick. And John? Uh, hi, I'm John Brown, Professor of Clinical Genetics at Newcastle University, and for the last 30 years I've led a series of cancer prevention trials funded by Cancer Research UK. Uh, our signature dish was demonstrating that two aspirins a day would reduce by half the incidence of colon cancer in people with Lynch syndrome, involving a study across 16 countries. And I also was Deputy Chair of Specialised Commissioning for NHS England for five years uh, and subsequently chaired a hospital group for six years. So I know a little bit about the service delivery side as well. Thank you, John. Katie? Thanks, David. I'm Katie Spencer. I'm a clinical oncologist from Leeds Cancer Centre and based in the Academic Unit of Health Economics in the University of Leeds. I work on cancer policy with a particular focus on inequalities in cancer care and outcomes. Thank you, Katie. And last but not least, Matt. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Matt Fagg, I'm Director of Prevention and Long-Term Conditions at NHS England. So I've got a portfolio that covers uh, a number of our uh, sort of population level long-term conditions, so respiratory, CBD, diabetes, uh, and then I cover policy on modifiable risk factors as well. Thank you very much. So as you can see, we've got a, a, a very diverse uh, panel that covers really uh, many of the factors involved in what it would take to prevent cancer, um, stemming from the uh, biomedical research through to the economics and implementation. So the the topic of today's is discussion is uh, understanding the economic and regulatory ch challenges around cancer prevention. Um, I think that most people would recognise the the importance of trying to prevent cancer. You know, we're we're in an ageing society with an increasing uh, incidence of numerous uh, risk factors around cancer, um, obesity, you know, exposure to pollution, and so on, and the incidence rate of cancer is rising. And you know, despite our best efforts uh, to to treat the disease, uh, the the number of deaths are rising. And so, you know, the, 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 the hypothesis that prevention is better than a cure, uh, I think, certainly holds for cancer. And despite this importance and this growing imperative for us to try and be able to prevent cancer, our, our progress there is limited. And uh, the proportion of funding for cancer research that goes into research to try and prevent cancer is, uh, I would say, almost embarrassingly low uh, and that's a you know a mea culpa on our, on our part but it's really um uh the case across the system um disease prevention generally it's something like between five and ten percent uh of uh, research spend uh, goes on uh, research into prevention so what is it that's holding us back um you know, why Why uh, do we see so few things moving through a pipeline uh, from ideas uh, into implementation to prevent cancer? And as part of this discussion, we're going to cover really the whole spectrum. And that could be efforts to prevent cancer through uh, vaccination, through drugs, but also through um, behavioral mod uh, in uh, interventions. So, you know, reducing your exposure to modifiable risk factors through things like tobacco cessation, being a, a prime example of somewhere where it's worked fantastically well. 
uh, but also through into um, the kind of the the, the policy um, end of the spectrum, where you know um, uh, legislation change can help um, reduce uh, exposure to risk factors. And I suppose the the hypothesis of this discussion is that at least part of the problem is uh, one of, of economics and regulation, that our system isn't geared to accommodate uh, changes that will help prevent disease and to prevent cancer specifically um, in the way that we fund, the way that we reimburse, the way that we regulate um, and, and make policy. So that's the mission for today is to, to have this discussion. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to go to each one of my uh, panelists here to have a, a kind of opening uh, salvo on uh, what they think, you know, the, the really pressing challenges or, or perhaps opportunities are uh, in economics and regulation around cancer prevention. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a discussion uh, amongst the panel. Um, at a certain point in the proceedings, I will also throw the uh, uh, floor open um, to, to you, uh, our dear viewers, to field your own questions. So um, you'll see the chat function there in Zoom. Um, at any point, feel free to pop some questions for the panel into that chat. Uh, I will endeavour to you know, keep one eye on those uh, as we proceed. Um, and perhaps um, you know, two thirds of the way through this uh, uh, time, I'll start drawing on questions uh, from, the, from the, the audience and, and feed those into the panel. So please do submit. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to uh, go to our panelists and, and say, um, give us a, you know, two minutes on uh, what you think the pressing challenges and opportunities are in this space. Um, perhaps we'll go in the, the same order as the, as the intros. So uh, Nick, would you like to start the ball rolling? Yes, of course. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I, I think lots of potential challenges, but, but maybe just to pick one to, to start. For me, uh, there's a big challenge around, uh, as you were sort of hinting there, making the case for funding. So like it or not, uh, there is competition for scarce resources and decision makers across government um, within the NHS need to determine whether they should invest in cancer prevention or spend taxpayer pounds on something else. Um, I think a key part of making the case for funding is about understanding the harms of cancer. Uh, Frontier Economics did, did a piece of work on this, looking at the economic and societal costs of preventable cancer. Uh, and to give you a, a flavour of the results, so we looked at 2023 uh, and our analysis found about 184,000 uh, preventable cancers diagnosed in the year. Uh, and the total costs associated with those cancers, we estimated to be over a hundred billion pounds. Looking ahead over 15 years, uh, those, those costs uh, add up cumulatively, cumulatively to almost two trillion up to 2040. So some potentially significant numbers here. And to give you a sense of what's driving those, so around 60% is costs to individuals. So this is costs in terms of mortality, so people dying earlier than they otherwise would as a result of preventable cancer, and also morbidity. So this is people uh, suffering poorer quality of life as a result of preventable cancer. That's about 60%. There's then a further 35%, which is costs to the economy and cost to economic growth. Uh, and this is from uh, individuals uh, requiring absences from work or being unable to participate in the labour market as a result of poor health. The remaining 5%, which might sound relatively small, but is still billions of pounds, is those sort of cash costs, if you like, to the health and social care systems. So this is the cost of diagnosis, of treatment and of care for those individuals. So for me, this was quite an interesting bit of analysis to, to be involved with uh, in, in setting, if you like, the size of the prize that exists from greater investment in cancer prevention, if we can find the way to make that case persuasively for, for funding. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, those are 
uh, impressive numbers. And, uh, you know, I think we all kind of in instinctively recognize the, as you say, the size of the prize that's there to be played for. Um, John, over to you. Yeah, thanks, David. <clears throat> so I, I'm obviously biased as a geneticist to looking at people who are genetically susceptible to cancer. And there are a lot of them, around about 1% of the adult population carries a high penetrance gene. But of course, there are many other genes that add to their susceptibility. And so I think my first comment is we have to try and escape from the one size fits all when it comes to intervention in this space. Clearly, there's much we can do on a one size fits all in terms of avoiding carcinogens like asbestos and tobacco and enhancing uh, lifestyle, uh, giving people access to the right diet and so on. But when it comes to our interventions, uh, we really need to be more focused for two reasons. First of all, because people who are at increased risk are more likely to be motivated to take part. Um, and I, I think the other problem is it just takes a long time. And for the first five years, all you get is the bad news. So you cause any side effects you cause will be the ones that you see and you can't prove you prevented any cancers for a long time. And indeed, in my world with aspirin, uh, we had dozens and dozens of trials for aspirin preventing heart attacks. It was only when um, Peter Rothwell and colleagues went back to tra track down the many thousands of people who had taken part in those studies that we found that they were significantly protected against cancer. But that wasn't part of the original trial. And sadly, we're now addicted to the randomized control trial. And you have to say at the beginning what you're going to do and you have to get an answer in three years or they won't give you any more money. So I think clearly if you want to do a randomized control trial, it's very difficult. And I am invited here because I managed to pull one, a couple of them off. And that's partly for two reasons. One is that Cancer Research UK have for a long time seen this as a, as a target for their efforts. And it fitted very nicely with our efforts to uh, to track down and, and better care for people with high genetic risks. Um, but also, uh, we obviously have the benefit in the NHS, especially of a, of a comprehensive healthcare system. So it's easier to track people in the system. Uh, and they're less anxious about data on their cancer risks and so on being shared. So it puts us in a particularly strong position. Uh, but I, that doesn't minimise the downside, which is finding the right agents to use, whether they be vaccines or drugs, comes up against the commercial reality of clinical trials of this sort, where it's a long time to intervene before you make any money. Uh, and unless we can create a system where the pharmaceutical industry in particular see this as a benefit, then I, I, as a member of boards of companies as well, I, you know, you have to say it's not in the company's best interest to move into the prevention space. There's a great chance they'll lose a good drug and it might be a long time before they make any money and their patent will have run out before they do. All right, thank you, John. So we've we've heard the uh, size of the prize, and now we've uh, heard uh, why the why companies aren't already leaping all over this. Um, Katie, uh, thanks, David. All yeah. yours. I think I would build on um, what both Nick and John have said. The size of the prize is huge, but actually, we do have to target uh, interventions to those at high risk because even those who are at high risk are not guaranteed to develop a cancer, and inevitably. In these interventions are going to be delivered to large numbers of patients over prolonged periods of time and consequently they have really high budgetary impacts. So we may define, find that these are cost effective in traditional terms and the way that we would analyse cost effectiveness but actually they still have a huge budgetary impact and that means that we really need to be able to think about well how are we going to afford to deliver this, how can we target it to the population most at need and how can we afford it? And it may be about thinking about this as an investment in the same way as Rachel Reeves has just started thinking about changes in the way that we think about capital investment. Is that how we should think about public health investment as well, where it is a true investment in our health going forwards? And I think I would take this on further to say that large budgetary impacts have somewhat distorting effects on the rest of healthcare. And we often don't know already where the opportunity costs of interventions lie. And that is particularly true when we start having big impacts. We're already then at risk of causing sort of effectively damage to the health of some populations by doing that and worsening inequalities. And this second in parallel, we need to make sure that any interventions that we deliver 
are going to deliver health to the whole population, that we don't end up with some parts of the population who are effectively cut out by the, the intervention and the way in which it is implemented. So I think those to justify any sort of major budgetary impacts as well, we've really got to understand where is the cost going to fall and how are we going to make sure that these address the need across the whole population right. and don't inadvertently widen inequalities we already right. see in cancer incidents and survival. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, yeah, no, uh, clearly we are going to uh, need to be very, very conscious of uh, the potential to widen disparities. And I think that's something we'll uh, come back to in the discussion later. Uh, Matt, over to you, please. Can't hear. On mute, Matt. Sorry. Um, I was just starting to say that I think prevention means very different things to different people. Um, and I think you, re you reach very different conclusions about the economics of prevention uh, depending on, and the timeframes for benefits, depending on your starting point. So if you take prevention as preventing the onset of illness and disease, and you focus on younger cohorts, then potentially, you know, if you, if you stop a young person becoming obese, then it could be 30, 40 years before you start to see the return on investment at the point they would otherwise have become ill, at least from a health perspective. Whereas if we focus on a cohort that are already in contact with the healthcare system, in some ways that's suboptimal because they've already got risks, but actually the return on investment may be much more rapid. Uh, you know, losing a yeah, patient with cardiac disease, losing weight, you see benefits very quickly. So, so there are kind of policy choices that we need to make. I think for me, the, the big challenge is that we need to face as a healthcare system is the projected growth in morbidity between now and 2040. And that will be driven largely as a result of an aging population. And we're expecting a 40% increase in morbidity over that period of time. So you have broadly a doubling in the proportion of old, very elderly people. Um, but the working age population will increase by only 2%. So we are going to have broadly the same number of people as we have now, but needing to support a larger number of people with morbidity. So I think there is a real policy priority to focus on the health of working age populations. And I think that will be an issue for the next 15 years. By 2040, we ought to be at a point where there's no longer an aging population. This is largely based on analysis from the Health Foundation, but I think the general view is it's fairly credible. Um, I think in terms of priorities, I think addressing modifiable risk factors is really important. They have a very broad effect. Um, and whether we re reduce weight in younger cohorts or in cohorts that have already got disease, actually there are benefits in uh, preventing exacerbation of disease, preventing the progression of multimorbidity. Um, and so I think that is a priority. I, I do think there are some systemic barriers in the system to, or to prevention. And I think, for example, the the current um, technology appraisal process that NICE have got mandates the requirement on the NHS to implement certain treatments that have a NICE technology appraisal. And the new treatments tend to, to be the ones that go through technology appraisal process. So, you know, for example, at the minute, we're looking at tazepatide, which is a high cost drug for the management of obesity, and that will be mandatory on the NHS, whereas weight management interventions which are probably much more cost effective, or they are much more cost effective, uh, will not be mandatory. So we do have some systemic barriers in the way the system's set up. And they're set up for a reason, because we're trying to stimulate the life sciences se sector, the, the rapid adoption of innovation. But it does skew the system as a whole towards certain aspects of healthcare, sometimes away from the ones that might make the most sense at population level. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> really good points. Thank you, Matt. So perhaps if then we start the discussion by um, building on uh, what uh, Matt has just said, but also I think that's been touched on by several others, is that if we think about cancer prevention strategies in the, the broadest sense, so, you know, it could be public health campaigns, it could be screening programs, it could be um, research to bring through novel, you know, biologically driven preventive agents like vaccines or drugs. Now, all of that requires significant upfront investment um, and there's an initial high cost then there's a 
enormous lag, as Matt points out, until you see a return on invest in, on return on investment, either a return on investment through you know um, additional years lived in good health, or financially, you know, if you're a, a drug company. So is that is that time lag, the lack of you know obvious or timely return on an investment? a major or insurmountable barrier for doing more in cancer prevention. Who'd like to take that one? Uh, Nick? I'm happy to, to, to start the conversation, but I'm sure others will jump in. I think what that points towards, which sort of picks up uh, comments that were already made around timing and around targeting, I think there's, I think what, what the current system therefore sort of guides us towards, rightly or wrongly, which is then a, an interesting discussion in and of itself, is towards those particular interventions which would pay off over a shorter period of time. So NHS organisations, for example, will have a, a much stronger incentive for those interventions which might pay back within one, two, three years. I think it also leads to uh, prioritising those interventions which are more targeted, as, as Katie was suggesting, which can be both an opportunity and, and, and maybe is valuable in terms of targeting, but actually can potentially uh, have uh, unintended consequences in terms of, of inequalities. Um, I think probably the other relevant to, to throw into that is not all interventions are high cost, lots of them are, there are but there are things that you can do uh, in terms of uh, behavioural changes and risk factors in, in terms of sort of banning things, for example, which which are not in a sort of cash sense costly. They have significant other costs potentially associated with them. But but I think those are some ways in which those incentives might start to play out. John? So I, I also already um, emphasized that I am a geneticist and I see the world through that prism. But the, the, the thing that got our trials off to a, a running start was meeting a young boy of 12 whose mother had hereditary, a hereditary cancer condition called familial polyposis. And he just had a colonoscopy and he didn't have any polyps yet. But I, could, I knew he had the gene because he had external features. He had bumps on his head and so on. And that was what made me think, you know, we need to be intervening on people who have this genetic predisposition. A, because they're highly motivated, B, because they're already under um, surveillance by the system, and C, because they're statistically enormously powerful because they get so many cancers at such a, a, a young age. Um, and so I think and I think that model still holds. I mean, I think now it's much more common, following her too and all the rest of it, to think of a genetically targeted subgroup, which allows you both to shorten the time to a result and give you more biological information about the mechanism in play. But it also effectively allows you to sort of provide data which you can extrapolate to the wider population. So we know, for example, that about one in six bowel cancers have a breakdown in mismatch repair, which is the genetic condition in Lynch syndrome. So it's reasonable to assume if we can do stuff for Lynch patients, it'll probably be irrelevant at least to that one in six of the population mm -hmm. present with more common cancers. So I think there is a very powerful argument for focusing on those people at specific risk because of all of the, 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 the positive vibe you get, if you like, from doing longer term prevention work. Mm -hmm. the, the only the only other thing I'd say there is that what we think, what we have to be careful of is that everyone's always looking for the the marker of pre prevention. The, the cardiologists had the advantage of being able to measure cholesterols and so on as a as a, a, a representation of what the future would hold. Uh, we've tended to rely on a few things like polyps and so on, which are not always a predictor of cancer. In fact, and so the danger is that you set up your trials to look for surrogate endpoints. And then if you don't see those surrogate endpoints, you think it's not going to work. But in fact, in our case, we didn't prevent polyps, but we did prevent cancer. So, you know, the surrogate endpoints can be a threat, but they are one of the ways forward. But I would certainly emphasize the value of these high risk populations, as, you know, because they really are enthusiastic about prevention. Generally yeah. speaking, you don't get thanked for preventing cancer because the people who would have got it didn't know they hadn't had it. Um, but in the case of people with genetic predisposition, they thank you. They get the idea of prevention, mm. a, an option for them. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm personally, I, I completely agree with you. I think I'm, I'm very interested in uh, 
better understanding of high risk groups and, and broadening out the sort of stratified approach. Um, I suppose the problem is that sort of economically, even then, uh, the, there's still a significant lag between intervention and uh, measurable benefit, uh, particularly, as you say, as if we're still sort of uh, addicted to the RCT model. Um, you're still talking about, you know, often decades in, in some cases to demonstrably show uh, impact on mortality. Um, Matt has a hand up. Yeah, I was going to make a broader point, which is that, I mean, the reality is resources are significantly constrained at the minute, and, the, and I think that's going to be the case for a number of years. Um, and politically, uh, the politicians are going to have to make difficult decisions about resourcing, and when there were lots of short-term pressures, it's difficult sometimes to make the longer-term decisions. But I don't think it's insurmountable, and actually, if you look at the last few years, uh, and I'm, I'm talking specifically from a sort of NHS perspective, but we've seen quite a significant expansion of NHS investment in prevention since 2019. Um, and if you look at things like the targeted lung health check, for example, which has been rolled out now, it takes time and it's frustrating that it takes time to go from pilots. I can't remember when, you know, the first pilots in, I think it was Manchester, I remember them sort of talking about having piloted it, it was probably... 2015, something like that. I'm not quite I've got the right dates, but you're talking the best part of a decade to have got to full national rollout. But it does happen. Um, and I do think uh, it's a great example of where we have made the case for prevention. And uh, through that programme in particular, we are targeting some of the highest risk people for you know, future poor health, mm. uh, former smokers. Um, yep. But I think, uh, you know, ideally, you want a strategy that includes a whole range of sort of long-term and short-term uh, impacts, if you like, interventions. Mm. I think it, it's been enormously encouraging, Matt, to see the um, some of the kind of uh, language and rhetoric from the, our new incoming government still, you know, emphasising the importance of, of shifting to a more prevention and health maintenance model. Um, and I wonder whether uh, the 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 inevitable short-termism of a political cycle uh even with the will to shift more towards prevention if it's if if you still got to manage within a resource constrained environment and prevention is all upfront cost initially that is then sort of hypothecated on cost saving down the line when you know you prevent cancer you, you people don't go on to get late stage cancer and die from it you spare the cost of late stage care so it's sort of hypothetical benefit that's going to end that's going to be accrued later it's not within the cycle of this government to even see that benefit so you know is the will to invest heavily up front really going to be there when the cost pressures on the nhs are so great but come back on that i mean i hope so um and i think not i mean, I mean some preventative strategies are longer term than others. If you take, for example, cardiovascular disease risk factor management, if you classify that as prevention, and I would, then actually you can see sure. a rapid return on investment from that. I mean, some of the evidence suggests that if we control people's risk factors, we, we should be able to see an impact on their kind of risk of a heart attack or stroke within mm -hmm. a short space of time. Um, you know, but probably because, as, as John points out, they've got the surrogate endpoints. You know, we know if you, we can drive down blood pressure, we can drive down cholesterol. We know that equates to health benefit because it's been proven in massive trials, and we just we don't yet have those validated surrogates for cancer. It's possibly a challenge. Um, Katie's been patiently uh, waiting with a hand up. No, I was just going to add in um, with regard to the sort of cardiovascular outcomes and so on. We need to be making common cause with colleagues outside of cancer, because actually, you say you rightly say that many interventions will still have costs, but preventative sort of modifications to lifestyle and avoidance of exposure to risk factors are not high cost. And in fact, some from a sort of governmental perspective could actually be beneficial in terms of, in, of tax income. Um, but I think they don't impact just cancer they also impact cardiovascular comorbidities. If we're talking about exposure to um, air pollution, then clearly that has major impacts upon respiratory health, both in childhood and adulthood. And actually we, uh, as in the cancer community, maybe need to make greater common cause with our colleagues across medicine and recognise that actually this burden of comorbidity 
may be where we can also help to sort of drive the case because some of those will deliver improvements at a much shorter time frame than we will see in the cancer setting um, and it would be beneficial to to yeah yeah to work with our colleagues there agreed yeah so and that's uh, it's a really interesting uh, point is is um having i suppose a, a wider more sophisticated model for the benefits that are accrued through preventive intervention and health maintenance that aren't on a single disease you know single outcome track um and uh, nick i will uh, throw to you in a second because uh, the next thing i was going to talk about was exactly this so um if there perhaps is reticence to invest in and bring through preventive interventions when we don't you know when we're going to have to wait 10 years to see genuine impact in many cases can more be done with modeling and should that should economic modeling be a much stronger part of our decision making process and should the, you know if we had really sophisticated uh, models of you know intervening in public health and you know you could say through a public health uh, uh, legislation uh, that's something that drives down pollution something that reduces access to you know harmful dietary components um, or you know I don't know let's say um, a medical intervention that interfered with inflammation which is a common you know uh, risk for many many different diseases you know could could we do with more with sophisticated modeling to say we can show through the data that we have in a relatively short term that we are likely to impact on X, Y, and Z. Uh, and, and should we then be a little bit more, more prepared to act based on that versus the 10 year horizon or the 20 year horizon of a, a randomized controlled trial? So Nick, I'll come to you. I also note a comment uh, in the chat there from David Colcoon saying we are addicted to the RCT model to prevent fraud. Uh, completely legitimate point. You know, that is the way that we sort fact from fiction currently but is there another way uh, through modeling perhaps nick well i mean I, I can only say yes to that obviously david clearly more more uh, economic health modeling is, is always a, a good idea but i think specifically as, as you say I, I think it can help in in some particular ways so i think it's partly about understanding long-term impacts in that payback period and what interventions can pay back over one, two, three years within a, an electoral cycle, as it were, to be cynical, but, but also within those sort of budgetary uh, horizons as well. Um, but I think certainly I wanted to reinforce the, the point that Katie made, which is um, the, the, the challenge of multimorbidity is also in that respect a massive opportunity, because if you're able to get at those determinants of of poor health, which I can see that there's another question sort of hinting at that. Actually, that can unlock benefits across a whole range of conditions. And, and that's where I think more modeling in particular can help to make that broader case. Because it, in a sense, I fell into this trap in my opening remarks, looking just at the costs associated with, with cancer. But actually, if you look at it from the other perspective of a behavioral intervention, which might be focused around tobacco or uh, around alcohol or about uh, diet and, and, and lifestyle, those would actually unlock benefits, not just in, in cancer, but also multiple other areas. And so I think getting that more joined up picture to inform the policy debate is probably where, where, where more, more thinking, more modelling can certainly be valuable. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Nick. Um, I'm not 100% uh, sure which order the hands were, but I think it was John, then Katie, then Matt. Uh, I just want to respond to you the comment from David that you picked up from the chat. Um, I, I, having just led my third international trial, I am addicted to randomized controlled trials, so don't get me wrong. But, but they're also liable to error, especially in this space, because if, for example, we were using aspirin uh, as one of our major interventions, you can buy aspirin yourself. So the, the possibility for people dropping in in placebo groups and so on becomes a real issue. And there are lots of ways that randomized controlled trials, especially when they're presented I have to say, from the pharmaceutical industry, where they want their drug to win, uh, there are ways of reading a trial uh, in terms of how you set your controls up and so on that will benefit that. Plus the fact we very rarely get to compete one drug against another, which is what we really want to do in a randomised trial. So I, I, I wouldn't suggest, I would argue that randomised control trials are not the be-all and end-all. And, and when you've got very high-quality population-level data such as we get from UK Biobank, such as we're getting now from our 
national registries of people with hereditary cancers, um, you can do as well as randomized controlled trials without necessarily having placebo control. Uh, you know, there are, we should be looking at imaginative ways of doing it. The other thing I would uh, want to just not lose sight of, though, is, is how difficult it is for someone who's for the pharmaceutical industry who have a drug that might be a preventive agent. It's all threat and no promise. Uh, we need to think of some way of protecting those agents that have a credible lifespan as a preventive agent beyond the current 20 year span, because it isn't long enough. Uh, if it takes you 10 or 15 years to prove it works, you're not going to make any living out of it because the generic companies will just take the profit that you would have generated. So I think there needs to be a revision. In the same way as we revisited the, the nice guidance on rare disease, for example, of how much, you know, what the quality life years cost is for a rare disease compared to a common disease. Um, and, and so I think there are some opportunities there. And I've already said in the past to you, David, I also think that Cancer Research UK do a fantastic job. I have to say that, don't I? I'm funded by them. But but I think trying to sort of design a, a modelling system where you don't necessarily need to put a bid in for five years funding to try and do a trial. It took In every case of my three trials, it took three or four years of getting the funding before you started. And I think you could potentially design a system which says we're going to do this trial and then just choose who's going to do it, but short circuit that early stage uh, where there is an obvious health gain for the net, for the nation to pursue it. And I'm, I'm clearly not going to be the person leading such a trial, so I can say that hand on heart that I'm doing it on behalf of others. Okay, well, thank you for uh, putting um, CIUK on trial uh, as part of this discussion, John. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so, uh, Katie, I think, was next. Yeah, um, I think this is coming from a, an economic modelling perspective, and I... I sort of inclined to agree with Nick, economic modelling is always useful. Um, but I think one of the things that health economic modelling often offers us is actually a recognition of uncertainty. And so the point about causality and uncertainty about causality in the absence of randomised controlled trials is a really, really important one. But I think we can actually start to get to that to a degree using health economic models. And we can test those hypotheses. At what level do we need to be seeing a benefit for this intervention to be cost effective? And actually, over time, a priori planning, how are we going to change our model? What will we integrate into our model? So that actually, in a sort of evolutionary way, we say, right, we've started with a simple model. As we gain more knowledge, let's adjust our model and let's continue to say, can we, is, is it plausible to think that the ultimate outcome of this study will be this proportion of, of improvement and reduction in risk? And what is the uncertainty about that around that? And as we gain more data, the uncertainty around that will fall and our confidence that this is a cost effective intervention will rise. And we can then make our trials a little bit more flexible. So instead of saying you have to have 10 years, 15 years of, of follow up, we can start to say, actually, we will follow up until either we say it's highly unlikely this is going to be cost effective. Let's stop. Or actually, we are really quite certain already that this is going to be cost effective. Let's stop and let's start this and, and use this not just in research, but in the routine in routine care. And I think that flexibility comes from the, the sort of approach that mm -hmm. we to take. So that um, that's a really interesting uh, point, Katie, and it's something that we often consider is, you know, should we have um, a more flexible approach and should we, you know, move into sort of piloting of interventions uh, based on a lower threshold of data than one would accept for full implementation? And then you're effectively doing a real world uh, trial um, and the more data you accrue, the more confidence you get and then the more you would roll out widely or pull back if it's not working so that oh, oh, david i would also come back there to, just to say mm. um i think that can also support you to say actually no don't do it yes you can do the, yeah, yeah. Model at yeah. the outset and say no there is no way this is ever going to be cost effective mm -hmm. stop so, now so then that and, and in principle that that sounds very attractive i suppose the challenge to that would be um and, and I think John hinted at this earlier in, in the trial context, there may be adverse effects of your intervention that would not be apparent when you did the modeling. 
and and but, but that would only become apparent when you start doing the big trial in big numbers and so that could be you know pharmaceutical adverse effects it could be the, the sort of um you know the celecoxib uh, uh problem uh it, uh it could be um adverse effects uh sort of behaviorally or psychologically you know anxiety induced by indeterminate results of screening uh things of that nature so so how do we sort of square that circle economically open question let's go to matt and then anyone else can follow up on that if they want yeah i was probably sort of coming in on the question you'd asked before that and just the, the um, yeah, yeah. observations so i'm a policy maker rather than a researcher i mean i think it's absolutely key that we have a strong evidence base before we start investing public money uh, I always worry a little bit about modelling. I think during the pandemic, I saw a lot of modelling. Some of it was really good. Some of it maybe not quite as spot on as it could have been. Um, but I agree absolutely RCTs are not the be all and end all. And uh, we can be a bit constrained by that. And I think real world data is increasingly, uh, increasingly important and actually increasingly accessible as well. Um, you give an example, we, we kind of looked at establishing a diabetes prevention program and we felt we didn't need to pilot it there was enough evidence internationally but what we did was captured real world data and we've now got a massive data set of 1.6 million people uh, and actually we can kind of link that with other data sets um, we, what we've seen is that the, there's kind of impact far beyond reducing diabetes so it's basically a, lot, a basic lifestyle intervention it's essentially a weight loss intervention uh, and whilst we saw a reduction in diabetes which we would have expected actually we saw reductions in a whole range of conditions which aren't normally associated with diabetes including cancers um, there is something about supporting the wellness of people through those interventions but icbs now have access to absolutely massive data sets most of them have got population health uh, systems where they can directly access GP data and it opens up a whole world of possibilities using real world data to analyze problems rather than necessarily always needing you know a new trial yeah yeah um thank you Matt so perhaps if we can we can come back to something that uh, I think John um, raised the specter of um so economically how how do you think we can better incentivize uh, industry to become engaged with the prevention agenda so you know you have the vast financial muscle of the pharmaceutical industry um which is almost exclusively focused on uh, developing therapeutics and in cancer's case it's almost exclusively <laughs> exclusively uh, centered on developing therapeutics for late stage cancer treatment um the, the the upfront cost is clearly a major deterrent in them investing in prevention. Uh, but John, you also uh, talked about the, the risk there is in it for them of adverse events popping up because of the numbers and because they're intervening in healthy people. Yeah. Um, is, is, is that a, you know, a deal breaker? You know, how do we get past that to in, incentivize industrial, you know, pharma investment in prevention? Well, David, you touched on celecoxib. It was actually rofecoxib, which was the big one, the Vioxx story. Um, right. That was the that was the one that really broke first and nearly brought down uh, was it Merck, I think. Um, it was, mm. Certainly, they lost a very good drug because of a slight increase in heart attacks. It has to be said that was a predicted risk factor um, that you know that they perhaps. Um, could have uh, expected that might be a problem. So we shouldn't extrapolate that being always the case, but there's no doubt that that um, uh, that if you've got a drug that you're giving to healthy people, younger healthy people especially, then you can't tolerate side effects to the same extent. So I guess one of the arguments is that we have to, in some way, try to indemnify um, the, the pharmaceutical company, which means sharing the cost of running those trials uh, rather than them having to put a huge amount of resource in. Uh, and but I think also this duration of, of, of patent. I mean, we know from from the rare disease uh, orphan drug story that if you can give them a small benefit, if you've got a drug that's almost off patent, but that if you can find another use for it through a prevention trial, then that could that could be a, an indication that only you're allowed to, to use. You know, somehow tilt the system. I'm looking at Matt here. You know, is there some way we can actually make it possible that you can only sell metformin for cancer prevention as a label if you are the one who 
sponsored the trial. You know, other people can mm-hmm. tell it, but they aren't allowed to mention cancer on their label. You know, that kind of nudge that just makes it a little more attractive to a company that doesn't really want to stick its neck out for a very long period of time. Or give them a cost, give them the tax benefit of running prevention trials. In other words, mm-hmm. they can write off prevention trials against their tax uh, liability. Again, that's rather like we see with research credits for small companies. Mm-hmm. Things like that can actually make, just tip the balance in favour of going for it. Yeah, no, that's a really good ideas. Thank you. Uh, Nick has a hand and then I'm going to go to uh, something from the chat. Yeah, thank you. Well, and I think partly John stole my thunder there. I, I, so I absolutely agree with, with the point John was making there about those little sort of marginal tweaks and nudges which can can incentivize or, or not. Um, and I think, but, but maybe sort of slightly bigger than that, and it's maybe still picking up Matt's point and the, the example of diabetes prevention program. I think if uh, if the government, if the NHS signals that it is willing to invest its own money, if it's willing to uh, to change its priorities much to, much more towards prevention, then I think that does open up uh, exciting opportunities for whether it's pharma companies, uh, you know, charities, you know, other you know, many other organisations to get involved and, and be part of that, um, both both from a sort of uh, sort of social mission, but also commercially, I think, if uh, if if, uh, if those signals are there that, that prevention is being taken more seriously, then I think that does provide a, a more conducive environment to, to get that, that co-investment or direct investment in, uh, mm. in, in mm. those areas. So um, that that sort of leads us quite nicely into um, there's a, a question and a comment in the chat uh, about um, well UK versus global. So um, Jack Scannell uh, notes that the NHS, while big in the UK, is too small to send relevant demand signals to the global drug industry. So it's hard to shift the focus of uh, R&D investments from the, of the drug industry without uh, showing it in the US effectively. Um, and uh, John Grogan asks, uh, he's, he says, Q, global press practices, question mark. So, uh, so I think um, what that's getting at is, is anyone else doing this any better? So can the UK even get there on its own, you know, in, in-house uh, by, by shifting economic or regulatory models? Do we have to wait for the states to do it first? And is anywhere else doing this any better? Uh, Katie? It's an interesting comment about the, the sort of differences around the world and need to uh, align incentives with the US healthcare system. Um, from a pharmaceutical company perspective, the US doesn't have anything like the same evidential sort of requirement and cost effectiveness requirement for the implementation of a, a novel treatment. It has the same clearly high safety standards, but actually in terms of efficacy and cost effectiveness, the the bar is set somewhat lower by the FDA. Um, so it's, it then makes you think that actually this is, is this really about cost? Because chemo prevention, this is long-term treatment of many, many people and therefore actually potentially hugely valuable to the pharmaceutical industry. And so actually the bigger issue, and as, as John has talked about before, is about that lag and it's about that time to knowing that you've you've got the the win and the patents actually going to reduce uh, a return for you um so i do wonder whether this is less about budgetary impact and nice and, and cost effectiveness on a global scale and more about those time scales that we've we've talked about before uh then i think john then matt I would actually invert that. I don't think the Americans can do this. I hope that I'm on the call who will be upset. But basically, it is so paralyzingly expensive to do long-term trials in America. And people aren't willing to divulge the critical information on their risk uh, factors. I mean, we, by comparison, um, you know, our team in the UK in National Disease Registration Service have now managed to embrace the the Lynch syndrome. We now have the you know the identity of over ten thousand people in England with Lynch syndrome who are logged into the bowel cancer screening program uh, and can be reached directly to take part in prevention trials. That is a huge power, and they are all they all of their cancers are being tracked by the the uh, cancer research by the cancer data system. 
So the cost of running a trial in that population is trivial compared to the cost of trying to do something like, like that in America. So I, I mean, we've already got an example of this with the gallery trial. I know Joe Biden was very cross that Grail brought that to the UK, but it couldn't be done in America. You know, and and that was able to take blood samples from 140,000 people, largely in deprived areas, and then track their cancer rates. Now, whether it works or not, the very fact that you could even think about setting up a trial of that sort uh, is only possible with our record system and our long-term comprehensive healthcare. So I would argue that we're actually in an extremely strong position as a country. We're not the only ones, but we are very strong because of the scale of our data. And I think even compared to most of Europe, we are better placed to do these kinds of trials and should be partnering with the pharmaceutical industry on that basis. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I mean, similar to John, I, I think, uh, I should st stress I'm not a researcher, but um, I mean, I think my observation is that we are seeing companies wanting to partner with the NHS to implement uh, drugs, particularly where they're targeting sort of population level um, therapies, uh, things like Enclizarin and some of the new weight loss drugs. And I think the UK is seen as attractive because we've got a centralised infrastructure, which can can be used to, to roll things out. Um, I think NICE, in the, the kind of credibility of having a NICE technology appraisal actually is important. And the data that we've got, we have one of the most sophisticated data infrastructures, particularly through uh, primary care data. Um, and so I think there are a number of reasons why companies do want to work with the UK. I think, you know, a, a challenge that we've got is uh, that we're, we're quite reliant on the capacity in general practice if we want to really deliver things at, um, at population level. And that remains uh, particularly challenging at the minute. Mm. Um, but it, yeah, that was my uh, contribution. Yeah, yeah. I, I should also, I guess, be noted that uh... Uh, a company's willingness to, to trial a preventive intervention in the UK is not necessarily the same as their uh, willingness to market it here and implement it. Um, uh, I think it was Katie then, Nick. Uh, David, you just said exactly what I was about to say. I think my thinking was more about marketing and, and willingness to invest in the UK for, from a sort of delivery perspective rather than a research. I could agree completely with everybody else. From a research perspective, we're in a hugely strong position, but actually ultimately investment and buying and buying drugs once they're created and, and approved that's potentially the, the bigger challenge for us that isn't there in the US so maybe there's some triangulation between them. Will that change under the new administration? I doubt it. In America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who knows? Um, David, I was, I was, Nick, please. Yeah. I was just going to make a, a quick point, sort of picking up on, on I think what, what John and, and Matt have both said around data, and I absolutely agree. I think uh, the NHS is in a in an enviable position uh, to be able to join up data, and, and it feeds in a little bit back to that sort of modelling question you asked earlier, David. But the sort of bigger, bigger sort of question you framed at the start around what are, what are the barriers? I think actually unlocking more of that data, joining it up better. There are some really exciting examples that, that I've been involved in around Greater Manchester, for example, where they're bringing together data sets in a way that allows you to do population level analysis that has not previously been, been possible. But, but I think we could go further and faster on that within the NHS to, to really capitalise on that, 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 uh, that potential comparative advantage that was described yeah yeah thank you nick um so i think we have about five minutes left so we'll start sort of wrapping up in a moment um i've tried to kind of uh, touch on many of the issues raised in the chat uh, throughout but i encourage everybody to peruse the chat because there's loads of helpful comments and suggestions as people flagging uh, various companies interested in the space people flagging um uh, resources and, and studies ongoing um, if you feel like you've asked a question and I haven't yet touched on your topic, feel free to repost a question at the bottom of the chat now and I'll try and grab it. Um, and then perhaps uh, one last uh, issue for the panel before we move on. Um, that uh, So we, we've talked about kind of population interventions, we've talked about policy interventions and, and medical interventions. Now, many 
preventive measures will require um, changes that influence lifestyle choices. Um, so, you know, tobacco and alcohol uh, restriction, um, you know, taxation on unhealthy foods, um, then implementing those kind of regulations can face uh, resistance, uh, I guess, both from industry lobbyists and, and um, uh, from government, but also from the public. Uh, if, if um, you know, if government level intervention to try and improve health is perceived as limiting personal freedom. Um, how, what do you make of that? And, and you know, can you see a way for us to perhaps work, work better with uh, stakeholders to, to, to try and address that? Nick, please. Well, I mean, I think an obvious recent success story, broadly speaking, is that, that the sugar tax, colloquially, as, as it's known, and I think, um, I think particularly on your point of working with industry to develop, uh, to develop that and to, to change behaviours, it, it's not perfect, but I think that provides a, a template for how these things can be done and are not necessarily, to come back to the earlier point, not necessarily hugely expensive up front. You do want to understand the the wider impacts on, on uh, and, and, and consequences, but but actually, I think there is a model there that that can work and, and can be can be replicated in in some of those other examples and those risk factor you know, sort of areas that, that you raised. It. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Matt. Next, then John, please. Yeah, when I when I first took on this role, one of my colleagues said to me that. You know, the, the trick to being successful is to make it easy for the politicians to make decisions. Um, and I think, you know, they, they will look at how uh, things are polling uh, and what the sort of public opinion on particular issues is and make judgment calls about the kind of risk of uh, risk of getting things through and, and how those will play out. And I, so I think there are things that we could do. I mean, I think having a strong narrative that's backed by clear evidence around prevention is really important. I think building alliances uh, between different groups uh, and making sure that we are pushing for the same thing. So I think if we, we try and develop a strategy for cancer prevention, then you're kind of in competition with people that are pushing for strategies on CVD prevention or whatever. Actually, the commonality in all this is modifiable risk factors where you know we stop people smoking, being obese and drinking too much, as well as the other risk factors. Then mm -hmm reduce cancer and CVD and I, I think there's there's something in that it becomes difficult if you're in government and you're you know as a new minister you get approached by all sorts of stakeholders they've all got a good case for why you should invest in something and you have to prioritize so the more we can kind of come with actually this proposal has got broad support from a whole range of stakeholders it makes it easier for them yes yeah and I, I think that's a fantastic point and I think um I, and as, as I would see it you know the, the future of uh adequate and equitable healthcare would be one of health maintenance, you know, across the board where interventions uh, should be focused on maintaining health rather than sort of treating disease or even picking off risk of individual diseases. And I agree that some of that will come through um, broad brush public health measures and the reduced modif modifiable risk factors. But some of that may also come through, um, you know, biomedical intervention that targets underpinning mechanisms you know that in modulation of the immune system seems uh, uh you know <laughs> a pretty core thing that impacts on cancer risk cardiovascular risk metabolic disease risk neurodegenerative risk um so so uh, you know ho hopefully that's the direction of travel um final thoughts from john and then katie and we'll have to wrap up yeah, I, I, first of all, I think one thing we can learn from the recent American election is that if something's the right thing to do, just do it and ignore the fact that people will shout at you. Um, and I think in terms of public in, public interventions, such as the ones that have been referred to, um, you know, we're always going to get the nanny state, um, you know, comment thrown back. But if there is a general public engagement, and Andrew Dillon makes the point of using public uh, citizens, juries and so on. But once we've made the argument that a particular intervention will reduce cancer risk, we should just get on and do it and, and accept that there will be those who, are, who disagree. And then the other point that was raised in the chat is that we shouldn't be medicalizing. I think the fact is that we are sort of medicalized by the modern world we live in. And we can't go back to being hunter-gatherers um, in the forests. We have to live in a modern world. So it may well be that we do need to modify our diet and maybe add some things. And obviously, the, the baby aspirin that I've spent so many years working on 
probably puts back something that we used to have in our natural diet uh, when we ate wild green plants that we don't have anymore from salicylates. So I think um, you know a little bit of intervention where people are fully informed and they want to take part, I think is defensible. Uh, and I'm pleased to say, Matt, that the repurposing committee is looking at this in January. So we might actually get one over the line. Uh, thank you, John. And final uh, word to Katie. Just for us. Just going to comment about the need to for making common cause across comorbidities, but actually making common cause more widely across mm -hmm. government. And I think to a degree that's what Andrew Dillon is is highlighting is the need to make common cause with the public and get the public on board. And citizens' juries are a great way to do that. And John's talked about public engagement and and actually building knowledge among the public, but it's also building the case across different departments of government that actually there will be benefits to this across other departments of government as well um, in terms of welfare spending and, and lots of other outcomes and so I think we need to think more broadly about what we mean when we think about the benefits of cancer prevention not only in terms of cost but but wider impact so that we can make the case to politicians more strongly in terms that they are, are happy to engage with and, and that the public similarly will engage with. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, a huge thank you to all of our panellists. I think that was a, a really interesting chat and uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, thank you very much indeed to everyone that uh, is in the audience and to the very lively chat. And I do encourage you all to scroll through that chat because there's tons of good stuff in there as well. Um, so I hope that was uh, fun for everybody. I hope that was interesting for everybody. Um, I hope we can keep this conversation going because it's just the you know the most important area I feel in in biomedical research uh, and healthcare. Thanks, panel. Thanks, Concilium. Thanks, CRUK. Thanks, audience. See you next time. <laughs>